Okay, so hello and welcome everybody to this wonderful Q&A session that you've all turned up for. Um, as I said before, this is about you getting the information you need without the fluff and empowering yourself to go forward and get the right treatment. And that might be something that I can offer or it might be something you find outside of it, but it's all about actually knowing what you need and um, being able to go out there and find it. Um, every other month I'm here doing this Q&A session um, and on the alternate months we have a guest, we usually have guests that come in on, you know, whatever subject that I think would be good for you and whatever I think would be um, a, a subject that needs more exposure. So um, last month we had Caroline and I, and I did send out the recording, so if you're on my mailing list then hopefully you've managed to catch up on that. Um, and Caroline was a hypnotherapist, so some really useful stuff there. Might be your bag, might not be. And then next month we have um, Nicola Farndell, who is a, a similar to me. She's a women's health coach, but dealing really with um, menopause and perimenopause and giving you your power back through menopause, helping you with all aspects of menopause so that would be a good one for you to turn up to as well and that's on um, the 7th of November in the evening so again if there's any suggestions that you could give me of things you'd like to know a little bit more about then you can put those in the chat box as well if there's anything as we go along then you know just add your comments in the chat box um, and as I said I've got some questions um, and if we just stick with those questions, then um, it may be that this isn't a very long session, which is fine. We have an hour, but we don't have to take the whole hour. So I'm just going to start with a little bit of a chat about a workshop I did recently, because um, in that workshop, there were nine women. And most of them had kind of seen each other because they were all people that went to a gym, a little community gym together. And most of them had kind of seen each other or knew each other or were friends. And they all kind of had different reasons or felt like they had different reasons or probably hadn't talked about their reasons as to why they'd come to that workshop. And it was really just kind of a dip your toes, find out a little bit more about hypopressives and how it helps pel pelvic floor um, dysfunction and, and recovering you know, how to recover from it. And one of the nice things that I did this time, and it's something that I do online, which is to ask you to, to, you know, you can always keep your question, anything you're asking me, you can keep it personal by just directing it straight to me. And then we can talk about it when we're not recording it. But again, with these women, I wanted to do a similar thing where I asked them their reason for being there. And I just thought it would be a nice way to start um, this session off was just to kind of read some of the things that they said so that you can appreciate that everyone feels the same. Um, it doesn't matter what age you are because probably the oldest person there was in her late 60s, early 70s and the youngest was probably the lady who'd literally just given birth three weeks before, um, I would say she's probably mid thirties. Um, and then the rest of the people that were there were, you know, it, they slotted in between, but there were a few ladies that had young children and then a few ladies that had older children. So, and the lady who was um, the oldest there, she actually had never had any children. So again, I'm just telling you all these details because for the majority of women that, that have issues, it's because of giving birth. It's because of pregnancy and it's because of giving birth, because of the extra stress on the system. But it's not always. And, you know, often in a, in a group of 10 people, you'll find one or two maybe that have never had children. And so it just proves that that doesn't have to be the case. Sometimes... Sometimes I've seen top athletes, um, you know, runners, gymnasts that have severe pelvic floor dysfunction and have never had children. 
Um, and that's just down to the nature of their training and their training training regime and that inefficiency to be able to handle the pressure that their training causes. So although we were all sitting here, you know, and whatever issues that brought us here is more than likely to do with when we had our kids, um, it's not always. I'm just going to start, I'm not going to read any names out, I'm just literally going to read what people wrote. So I said to them, give me your contact details, tell, tell me a little bit about yourself if you want to, or just put a sentence as to why you're here. So the first one is, um, since the menopause, I don't feel safe or confident. Well, that's quite powerful, I think. And then this one, um, had my youngest 12 years ago and never was consistent with pelvic floor exercises. Have had bladder urgency since and would like to tackle this. And this one's quite long. Hopefully I can read her eyes. I've got my glasses on actually. Um, had a fibroid em embolization procedure over a year ago as I experienced regular need to go to the loo and became paranoid. So ended up wearing period pants. I altered my diet. This did not do a huge amount to change symptoms. Um, since the procedure. I now manage things well, however, post period, I have more need to go to the loo incontinence than after a few days, and, and after a few days, symptoms disappear. My reason for this workshop is as a mum of three, one C-section, one with shoulder dis... You know the word. I, I, I can't quite read her writing and the word's gone out of um, she's put and very large nine pound twelve ounces, and I am petite. Um, so yeah, that's quite a detailed one that one. And then this lady says this workshop has come at a good time. Two weeks postpartum, two other children. This is my third. Had issues with the second baby, lots of pelvic floor difficulties. In the end, I had a back injury, and this meant I had to stop working. And this is when I um worked on my pelvic floor need to ensure this doesn't happen again so want to be on top of it and then we have be lovely to run sneeze cough etc without leaking and then for pelvic floor strengthening had two children in 2010 and 2012 struggle with leaking especially coughing laughing done pelvic floor squeezes, but hasn't improved. Um, I want to be able to trust my body again. It doesn't feel like it belongs to me. It feels unsettled. That one really resonated with me because when I had my boys, that was one thing is that I would always describe my body as disconnected from me. Like it just didn't feel like it worked together. So maybe there's a few of you thinking the same thing and that <clears throat> we can certainly work on that. Used to play lots of sports and now too nervous to do anything else but swimming because of fear of leaking. Had a gynae checkup and she recommended working on pelvic floor, but she wasn't too concerned. As she said, my pelvic floor was weaker, but not bad and no sign of a prolapse. But, you know, as women, I think we know ourselves, we know our own bodies. And sometimes when you're told things like that, it kind of almost is a bit dismissive of what we can feel and 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 kind of takes that power away, really. I've suffered with urge incontinence since having my first child six and a half years ago. And that's it. But I just wanted to read some of those out because actually when you put them all together, they're quite similar you know that we're all we're all looking at similar things there's a few in there that like I said there's the lady that that didn't have any children um menopause is a big one for causing a massive upheaval in the body just because of it's it's a stage of our womanhood and it's a stage of our aging process unfortunately and that the aging process we cannot stop but we can put things in place that can slow things down and make it not quite so hideous. 
Um, so with things like, you know, if you're if you're going through symptoms of the menopause and, and it's having a knock on effect to pelvic floor dysfunction that you might have or symptoms, then, you know, you need to be thinking about doing something about it. Um, OK, so we're going to dive in now. I just thought I'd start with that. So that was kind of where I'm going with my workshops. And I really would like to start having more of these uncomfortable conversations because I think the more we can all be in a room or all be on Zoom like this and know that we're not alone, it, it's, it's quite powerful. And, and actually to be able to go to our medical professionals and say, this just isn't good enough. And we know it's not good enough, but without us standing up and saying, we're, you know, we're actually telling people we're going privately, we're going and finding holistic treatments that work because you're unable to offer it. Um, but why are you unable to offer it? That's the only way we're gonna get anybody to change anything is to kind of stand up and say, this isn't good enough. And it isn't good enough. I mean, it's a shambles really. So, um, so yeah, get off my soapbox now. Okay, so have we got, is, Diane, This is this Diane, it, you sent me a couple of questions in, is that right? Yes, okay. Diane is here. But Diane says, what would be the ideal amount? What would the ideal amount of time be when doing the breath holds? There isn't an ideal time. OK, so when you first start doing hyperpressives and you're holding your breath, you shouldn't be able to hold it for a long period of time. Usually, if you're if you are able, like right, right at the beginning to hold your breath for a long period of time, like 10 seconds plus then what that means is you're not actually achieving a vacuum. You're, you're not getting rid of all of the air. So when you first start, that, that urge to breathe usually comes around five seconds. So when I'm teaching beginners, I would usually do like a bit of a five second count, especially if I've got a few, few people in a class to give them an average. Some people will be able to hold their breath for longer and some people will be able to hold their breath for less. So it's in the beginning, around five seconds is a good um, range. But what you'll find is as you get, you get it more and you, as you practice it more, then the amount of time you hold your breath will become longer. So that's progressing it. Yeah, and that's progressing the effect. So actually then that's, you know, that's a good thing because it's a training progression. However long you want to hold your breath for is up to you. If you can hold your breath for a long time, great. It just, if you just want that next breath that you go to, to take, just to be in the same rhythm as all your other breathing. So if you find that you're really holding your breath and you're thinking, I really need to breathe, and then you go to take that next breath in, then you've, you've held it for too long. So it shouldn't be a desperate gasp. It should, you, if I watched you, I, it would be seamless. You'd just go straight into your next breath as if, but you'd still feel like you needed to breathe, but there wouldn't be that desperate need to breathe. Does that make sense? And usually the longer that you're practicing it for, the more you can hold your breath. So, but I, I can't be bothered myself. So I know that sounds terrible, but I'm like, I do maintenance now because I don't have, pelvic floor dysfunction that bothers me it's still going to be there because it's a weakness that will or it's a bit of dysfunction that has come from having twins and living my life and it's, it's so it's going to be there and I'm just managing it but enable for me to manage it when I do my flow there'll be some postures where I like to hold my breath for a bit longer because I like the feeling of the depth of the vacuum so some of the things like all fours, think, things like half bent over, the, the vacuum feels deeper and I like to hold my breath for longer, but not past that point of it, of it being in the same rhythm. Does that make sense? So, you know, even in all fours, if I'm like 15 seconds in and I get a really strong urge to breathe, as long as I'm not going <gasps> to get the air in and it's just the same rhythm, then that's fine. So just play around with the with the postures that you find it easier to breathe in to, to hold your breath in for longer and it won't be sitting with your legs extended or sitting cross-legged because those are just really really hard 
to hold your breath for long periods of time anyway because of the way that your muscles are working to hold you up it's it, it they're, they're just not natural positions for you to do long breath holds in you try it but there isn't there isn't an ideal amount of time yeah is the answer to that it won't you know if if you're really doing lots of short breath holds all the time then then try and push it out longer but there's no like optimal time that you should hold it for okay and then diane also says what would be the telltale signs of having a tight pelvic floor um so i'm presuming you mean hypertonic so there's areas where there's too much tone would be that you your incontinence symptoms get worse so for example if you were um if you have urge incontinence that you really can't hold it that you just you know even with all of your might of using your pelvic floor you you still leak everywhere um and it may be painful because the the, the it's a little bit like um say for example you've been on the computer for for hours on end and you suddenly go to move and you get like that real sharp pain like in your scapular area where you've just been set in that position because you've been busy working away so often you need to have a little bit of a pressure point so that someone needs to kind of press on that area to let the muscles know that they they, they can release and that's exactly the same with your pelvic floor the, the, the areas become really really tight and unable to contract or release and just start and that they actually need a bit of internal release work to be done in order to to get that function back again or to get some of that function back so it's when they kind of get into that chronic phase where they can't really do anything and all they're doing is causing you pain that you might feel spasms or pain if you've got tight pelvic floor often with scars if if you've got birth scars like an episiotomy or a any tears then the they they can become over tight from doing pelvic floor squeezes um because areas of the scar will already be there'll be already be areas that are tighter anyway so in doing pelvic floor squeezes you just end up with areas of complete dysfunction um around the scar tissue so that's when you may have to go and see someone who does internal pressure point release i i had to do that so i i i had an episiotomy and no one said anything to me about doing any work on my scars or that pelvic floor squeezes may make it worse that was just what was given to help me with my incontinence and over a period of I would say eight years maybe less than that of doing regular pelvic floor squeezes it just literally got to the point where I couldn't stop weeing myself because they just the muscles just got so locked up and in the end, I went privately to a women's health physio who helped me with to release it. It's very painful. Um, and then you can get, um, if you know that you've got areas that were, are going to get stuck again, they, they whoever you see to, to help you may advise you to get like a wand. So they, they do these glass wands that you can use internally to do it yourself because you can find the, the bits where it's where it hurts, I can tell you. <laughs> and... I mean, it's the same. I, I'm, I'm a trained massage therapist as well. So when you're doing pressure point release, you actually you start. So say, for example, you're working on someone's shoulders or their neck or their back. You, you find that point that's really painful and stuck and you gradually increase pressure on it to until it releases off. And you can almost feel the tissue around it kind of going, oh, thank you, like releasing and, and, and giving way as you do that so yeah it's um it's the same sort of thing but internally so signs of, of having a tight pelvic floor would be that you know you would if you if you've got incontinence that it gets worse and if you've got a prolapse that you get more symptomatic because often with tightness or tension which is what we're talking about tension will cause a pull and if you've already got a prolapse it's going to pull on that even more and have make it even be in a worse position so you might find that if you've got a prolapse then and your pelvic floor is really tight then 
um, it, the symptoms of your prolapse will get worse as well. So let someone in. Okay, and then, so, you, okay, so I see you hear these terms, um, but how can an individual know what this is for themselves? So, I mean, hypertonic just means too much tone. So high tone, or not too much tone, but high tone is basically that what that word means. So if someone says to you, you've got hypertonic pelvic floor, that usually means there's too much tone somewhere in some of the muscles or some of the areas. Um, and if you have a scar, are you, if you, do you have a, a birth scar? Just nod your head or you can, yes, you do. Um, uh, and are you doing pelvic floor squeezes? Or you are, you are. So, so if you, I would just suggest that you stop doing them because they are just counterproductive to what you want. All they're doing is adding more tension. So unless you're working on your scar and having some internal release work done, the more, all those squeezes are just creating more and more and more buildup of tension in areas where you don't need it. And, you know, I know myself, like when my kids were 12, I was just at a point where, you know, this is ridiculous. I've done all the things I'm supposed to do. I've been doing my pelvic floor squeezes. I've been doing all my stuff that I learned on my PT course. None of it was working. And that's when I kind of went down the route of hyperpressives. Hyperpressives is all about being able to relax your pelvic floor and allow it to work as it should do. And often I get asked, oh, when I'm doing my, my breath, once I've held my breath, do I have to squeeze my pelvic floor? No, just stop, stop squeezing your pelvic floor, stop squeezing your abdominals, stop trying to hold everything in. It's, it's not how a functioning body works. Yeah, it needs to be able to relax and just move when it needs to move, contract and release when it needs to contract and release. So if you feel like you're going down the route of hypertonic pelvic floor, then you probably need to find someone privately, women's health physio, that can help you to, to release that. But ask those questions because a lot of private women's health physios don't do that internal work. So you need to find someone quite specific. Okay. Lovely. So Mary says, my question is about the lateral breathing part of hyperpressives. Is the intention that we eventually breathe laterally automatically? No, it isn't. Okay. Um, all the time to keep that connection between the diaphragm and pelvic floor. No, no. So what we're doing is we are, by, by getting the diaphragm and the pelvic floor to, to work together. Yes, when we're, when we're doing activities where we need to, fill our lungs more and expand the diaphragm more. Say for example, you might go for a, a bit of a fast walk up a hill, then you're gonna breathe better. You're gonna be able to expand and use your diaphragm. So your big breathing muscle is gonna be able to be used a lot better. And in, the, in, in that activity, your pelvic floor will be oscillating and moving and connecting because they have such a good relationship. But that relationship is built and changed through doing your hyperpressive practice. So just the same as, you do your yoga practice and your yoga breathing for your flexibility and your movement and all of the wonderful benefits for yoga is the same with hyperpressives. You do your breathing within your session. Yes, you do get some changes, but it doesn't mean to say that now we all go around doing lateral breathing. It just means that we're breathing better without realizing it. Yeah. And we've got much more autonomic control. So you know, when we go to sneeze, when we go to cough, when we have to run down the road after a road dog or our dogs run off or our child's run off or whatever it is, we know that, that that our whole system is working much better and that we won't have that we won't have that causal weakness in our system or a, or dysfunction in our system. So I like to liken it to a gym session. If you go for a gym session, you're going for a gym session and you're, you're thinking, I want to keep my muscle tone. So I'm doing the, the, these exercises because they're really good for building muscle and muscle retention, yeah? But you don't have to walk around all day doing squats and doing overhead presses and bicep curls to keep that. 
it it just is just happening in that session and then the next time you go you build a little bit more muscle and you do a little bit more training and so it's the same with hyperpressives hyperpressives starts to reprogram those pathways from the brain to the muscles and once they're reprogrammed unless you stop doing it they're going to keep they're going to keep in that groove because it works better for your body so hopefully that makes sense to everybody does that make sense mary you can unmute yourself if you want to Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, it does. So um, you know, when we're doing that breathing, it it's it's about the effects that it's having outside of the session, but it doesn't mean to say that we're going to go around doing lateral breathing. But I just know that when I'm doing sport and stuff, you know, or when I'm when I need my system to work for me and I can't always activate muscles consciously, then my autonomic is is right in there because it's, it's been conditioned that way through my hyperpressive session well that's what's so great about hyperpressives is you don't have to spend hours doing it to affect a change change starts to happen the minute you start to breathe better it's fantastic oh, there's a there's a really good video that someone did a presentation on breathing and she showed this video of the of the way that the diaphragm is so connected to the heart, the brain, that it's just like unbelievable. When you do that big lateral breath, the knock-on effect it has all the way through your body. And so especially with the brain in mind, you know, it's not just the physical changes that you get from doing that breathing, but it's the mental changes as well. And that's, you know, that's what is so key with it. Okay. Um, Jane says, is it really possible to have a prolapse? Um, I have a grade three sister seal and a tight pelvic floor. Yes. So we've, so with, it's funny because that's a similar question um, with regards to what Diane asked about a tight pelvic floor. So yes, absolutely. Because tight or loose, I mean, I think people tend to think that when you've got a prolapse, everything's loose and falling out and like, like jelly and nothing works properly and that isn't always the case we can be dysfunctional but really really tight and have lots of tension so it is really possible to have a prolapse and a tight pelvic floor and if you're doing pelvic floor squeezes when you have a prolapse and a tight pelvic floor if there's scars in play then you're really every time you do a pelvic floor squeeze you're making your prolapse and your tight pelvic floor worse so I told you I wasn't going to fluff it. You've got to stop doing pelvic floor squeezes if you have scars. Yeah. You've got to sort your scars out and you might never go back to your pelvic floor squeezes because you might never need to if you're doing your hyperpressives. But if you've got a tight pelvic floor, you need to have some of that internal pressure point release or some, some sort of work done on your scars in order to be able to prepare that tissue to then um, work properly through hyperpressives. So I started doing hyperpressives um, and probably a month in, I was like, mm, not, not feeling any benefits here at all. And I, and I was um, talking to a, a women's health physio and she said, look, let's just have a look at you and do an exam and let's see what's going on. And, and that's when she was like, ah, your pelvic floor is just like, there's areas that are so tight. There's so much tension there that we need to kind of get rid of some of that so that it can go, oh, it was almost like, oh, geez, thank you. And then the hyperpressives started to work really well. So it's not always just the solution to do hyperpressives. As I say, there's usually, there's sometimes there's other things that you need to be, um, looking out for and getting help with um jane says i've been told a lot of my discomfort discomfort comes from over tight pelvic floor muscles yeah burning aching difficult in relaxing the pelvic area as well as from the actual prolapse surely a prolapse means loose muscle tone nope no nope. a lot of, so 
all a prolapse means is that the organ or organs have moved out of position. That's, that's all it means, prolapse. It means to move out of position. And what medical professionals do is they'll grade it. So they'll grade it um, from zero to four. Four is completely out of the body. But even completely out of the body, there can still be tension and tightness in the pelvic floor because any dysfunction in the pelvic floor will mean it's not working properly. So therefore it's not doing its job of supporting. So um, that presumption that prolapse means that everything's sagging and falling out isn't the case at all. All, all it means is that, that usually it's tension that's pulled it out of position, pulled the organ out of position. So every woman that's had a baby will have had a prolapse, yeah? And they may have had a minor prolapse and never had any symptoms until they went through the menopause. So, you know, it may, that may be people that are on this call where they've never really had any symptoms, maybe had a little bit of incontinence afterwards, but they got on top of it and they were able to kind of get on with their life and started to go through the menopause and started to get symptoms. And again, the symptoms are there because in that case, the lack of um, hormones or the change in hormones causes that laxity in the tissue. So the tissue's changing, it's aging ultimately. Um, I know we don't want to hear that word, but the tissue is aging. And, and so in the case of menopause and perimenopause, it can be laxity. But a lot of the time with prolapses, you're given pelvic floor squeezes for everything that comes under that umbrella of, of women's health and pelvic floor dysfunction. So in, in my opinion, prolapse and scars pelvic floor squeezes just do not work because they're they're just the wrong thing to be giving that person um pelvic floor squeezes are just working on the pelvic floor i mean we know that that's connected to the diaphragm right we know that that big breathing muscle has a massive part to play in what happens with the pelvic floor right and yet we're still only giving women something that squeezes the area where they've got the symptoms. So it's about, you know, getting away from that thought that it's to do with your pelvic floor that's the issue and just looking at the bigger picture, it may be lots and lots of things that are going into play, but certainly with a prolapse, it doesn't mean loose muscle tone, no, not necessarily. Um, and it's possible to have both, yes. So hopefully that answered your question, Jane. So Mary, you wrote to me in an email and you said your question was around older ladies and leaky bladders. So I was going to ask you, what specifically did you want to know about that? Um, I, I, I first got to know about hyperpressives because I went to see a gynae physio. Yeah. And they were doing a, an audit at the time. Um, and she asked if I wanted to do a like um, a six week block. Yeah. And um, while I found it really helpful, um, and I did, you know, like during COVID, it came at a good time just before COVID. I was able to concentrate on it a lot and I'd done a lot. But where I'm finding, I've turned 70 now, I find, and it's a hard way to describe it, but if you can imagine you've got water in a saucer, yeah. And it's like, it's coming over the sides, you know, like. Yeah. So, for instance, if I get up during the night to go to the loo, I'm getting leak a little bit of leakage coming out, but it's not like I'm having to hold everything in. It's just coming away. Yeah. So a little bit of that is overflow, isn't it? So yeah. So it's like I, an overflow. Yeah. Um, overflow. But I'm, I'm fine and I can hold my bladder for ages and maybe some uh, i'm keeping my blood you know like i i drink a lot of fluid so i drink a lot of tea and things like that but I, i've went to decaf everything's decaf now and that's made a huge difference but i find when i do that urgency you know the key goes in the door yeah. and to get to the loo i'm having leakages before i get to the loo and so from when you started doing hyperpressives to now 
do you find it's improved or not? Well, it did very much initially. Um, but as I say, I think as well, there was a number of factors, you know, going to decaf tea and coffee that made a big difference. Um, but also, yes, I felt better within myself when I'd done the hyperpressives. And certain so positions. How regularly are you doing them now? Pr probably about, well, I've, I've, I've been a bit neglectful of them. I was doing, well, I was doing them every day. And then I was doing them, see, every, about three times a week. Now, I think initially as well, I wasn't doing them correctly. I was, you know, when you do that breath, I was still bringing my pelvic flow in. Yeah. So I don't think my technique was as well as it could have been. Possibly. What I would say is that it sounds like you need to be doing them really regularly. I know. Maybe for what? how long would you say you're spending on it? 10 minutes? No longer. Longer. Probably maybe 30 minutes. I go through the exercise, the range, you know. I have asked for another gainy referral. I'm waiting for it because there's probably about a 12 week waiting list. So, so I was actually going to go back and speak to the physio and just see, you know, if I could get the opportunity to go through the exercises with her or someone. It, I mean, have, have you done any of my training? Have you done any of the. Well, I did. I did come on one of your training days. Um, well, it wasn't a day. I think I, I emailed you a while ago. <sighs> All right. I lost my son. Okay. Because I was due to go on a training day. Yeah, take your time. And I just never got back to doing it. Okay, well, that's very understandable. And so here's the thing, your diaphragm is a muscle that holds emotion. Okay, and you're obviously, there's obviously a long way to go before you're going to feel anywhere near normal. Um, and that may never, that may never happen because that's a, that's a big thing, isn't it? Yeah. So your, your diaphragm probably is quite tight and holding a lot of emotion. You feel yeah. a lot of kind of tension in that diaphragm, anxiety maybe. Yeah. Um, and so... I in I think when I got the initial uh, examination of the physio, she did see I was very, very tight. Yeah. I was very, very small up there. My, my son had been born prematurely, you know, like 40 odd years ago. Yeah. Um, And I did have scar tissue. And, yeah. you know, and once I started doing that desensitization thing, you know, a little bit, it did, it did make a difference. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but it, it, you know, it's all stemmed as of getting older, the bladder has become more of an issue. I think if you could get into like a really good habit of, even if you just did some lateral breathing whilst you're lying on the floor, got it really good, got your diaphragm to really like start to work and stretch like it should do. So your rib cage is really stretching apart. And then you start to bring in some, some of the breath holds and you really work on your technique. And then whatever postures you've learned, because the thing is, because you're talking about someone else has shown you, there might be some other things that we can do. But if you've got a, a good routine of postures anyway, yeah. you know, just gradually bring yourself back into doing them every day. But I would I would say try and do a bit of targeted breathing on the floor. Right. That's going to really help with the kind of the the emotion, the emotional release mm -hmm. um, before you go straight into doing the posture. So if you've got time, you know, and you've got that like half an hour, you've got five or ten yeah. minutes you could spend on the yeah. floor, really getting yourself into a good rhythm with the breath. Yeah. And I do find it very relaxing. Yeah. You know, like it, I treat it as a, a, a bit of a mindful exercise in a way yeah. because it, it's, it is very relaxing to do it um but I don't think my technique was probably you know I think I still was holding that tension well if I mean I'm quite happy to do a a, a session with you on zoom if you uh -huh. uh, if you want to let me have a look at anything that you're doing so if that's yeah. something that you're interested in we can definitely do that or you know like I say I've still got online stuff where there's videos 
that you can watch for tech. Watch. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, you know, that would probably be my advice, but just, just be easy on yourself. You know, it, the, the, the diaphragm holds worry, tension, stress. Yeah. Yeah. And what that means for you and for anyone that's feeling like that is that, that a tight restricted diaphragm is going to make it really hard for you to do that lateral breathing. But because its best friend is your pelvic floor, then that's going to be tight and restricted as well. So in, in order to release your diaphragm and release that tension a little bit, you need to get back into that habit of doing a bit, you know, a bit more lateral targeted lateral breathing. Okay. Right. I'll give it a call. Yourself. Thank you so much for sharing that. And like I say, reach out if you do want me to um right. any of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna go to the chat now. And here we go. Now I can't see. Mia's got a question, a few questions. That's good. Um, how long before you start seeing results? God, there we go. That one always comes up, doesn't it? It's a bit like how long is a piece of string, really, because it depends on what your start point is, as in what's going on with you. Um, and, and so symptoms, maybe you may have lots of different things going on, or you might just have a, one set of symptoms. Usually what I would say is you go through this learning phase. So when you're learning it, you're not really doing that consistent breathing that you would do in the flow. So you have to go through that, but you can still see results within that learning phase. So the first three months, I would say that you're doing hyperpressives, you're still tweaking, you're still getting used to it. You're still in that learning phase. So still doing between 10 and 20 minutes, but it's more broken up practice. Usually by the end of that three months, you should start to see some symptom relief. It might have not gone completely away, whatever it is that you want to go away. And it might never go completely away because, like I say, it depends on the severity in the first place. But if at three months you have absolutely no, you can honestly say that your symptoms are the same as when you started, then what I would say is you need more of a multifaceted approach. You need to be thinking about talking to a women's health physio, women's health osteopath someone that does internal pressure point release, someone that can work on your scars if you've got them. Um, whoever it is, there are going to be other people that can help you alongside just the same as me. Um, so it's really hard one to say. Most people, I very rarely get someone say at that three month point that, that they feel exactly the same and it's not doing anything. Um, so yeah, it's a hard one to answer. Would you do your exercises daily? Yes, I would always say get into a habit of doing 10 to 20 minutes a day. Absolutely. Um, and should I be able to feel, feel the pelvic floor contraction when feeling the vacuum? Absolutely not. No, no. Just get get away from that whole feeling about of squeezing your pelvic floor because that's not what's happening with your pelvic floor at all. Sometimes, and I'm going to say this, but now, if th this isn't happening for you, then don't worry about it. But sometimes in some of the postures, it feels like you've done a pelvic floor squeeze, but you haven't consciously done it. That's the feeling. So for me, it was it, it was first noticeable in like the bent over positions because there was less work in holding me up in posture and more work towards the floor, like going with gravity, that meant that that I could feel that, but it, it took months before I felt that. And then one day it was just a bit like, oh, that was like I did a internal squeeze and I didn't. So you should not be um, thinking that anything, sh you should feel anything when you're doing the lateral breathing with your pelvic floor. It should all come from the diaphragm because there's no way that one can work without the other. Yeah, which is why pelvic floor squeezes just don't make sense in isolation at all um i just don't like them as you can probably tell so hopefully that's answered that um christine yeah says i've got a couple of male clients that have a beer belly and have diastasis recto because of it would hyperpressis be good for them to help with core yes and no if they don't want to lose weight and they've still got quite a big tummy then everything's stretched and 
it's a hard one i i would be encouraging them to lose a bit of weight in order to um affect a better result really um that would be my answer to that one but it's very common for anyone that's been especially with like that whole beer belly posture um to have a diastasis because um everything's stretched like as if you were pregnant but but they're not pregnant for nine they're not fat for nine months they've got a beer belly for nine months they've got a beer belly for years so all of that strain and that weakness across that um center line is is uh yeah is worse really so um i mean hyperpressive should help to bring to, to to coactivate the core and bring all the muscles and make everything work better together but then if you still want that stretch over the um you know the, the stretch of the muscles and you've still got that gap there's only so much you can do so like i say if they were leaner then they were it would work better oh, i told you there was gonna be no fluff <laughs> uh breath work is also great to keep our lymphatic system working well thank you christine uh up to what grade prolapse can hyperpressives help with um i would say that um probably a grade four which is completely outside the body has to be a surgically fixed if they suggest that or held in with a pessary um anything below a four then we can usually and again I can't promise anything but we can usually take it back a little bit so you know I've seen people with like grade one um grade two prolapse that they've they become symptomless and that's more important to me than what they end up what grade they end up with um so but but often we've had people say well, you know I had a grade two and now I I've got a grade one but I don't have any symptoms often a prolapse doesn't go go completely that we're always kind of living and managing our symptoms but it's more about being able to live being able to go and do those things we want to do being able to you know have a life do the exercise do whatever it is we we want to do without awful symptoms or without feeling um really vulnerable and like our body is working against us. So it's more about that. But grade four is just one of those things where I'd be, you know, it's, it's quite hard to affect a change when something is so far out of the body. Okay, uh, and that's it. That's all our questions. No more questions, anyone. We're already on the time. So we actually ended up talking, oh, nearly. We were nearly there on nine o'clock. So is anyone that's here, still here what have we got eight people left um got anything that they would like to ask uh, before we go um it's you know i just want you all to know that what we've been given with regards to i mean this this goes back to like what my mum was given my mum's in her 80s and she was told to do her pelvic floor squeezes and she was telling me like oh when i was in my 20s when you have kids make sure you do your pelvic floor squeezes or I didn't and I've got this and I've got that and you know it's no wonder that we that we question and we're worried about not doing pelvic floor squeezes and, and going against what's been given us because you know that's that's the information we've been gaslit basically with a and, and we're still being given terrible messages I you know I hear it every day now and I was said said to myself you know you've had twins what do you expect by a man um you know I, you know I, I don't think anyone should expect to have incontinence anyone should expect to be wearing pads to not being able to do the exercise or do any activities that they love to not live a full life well into their 80s um with any of those issues and you know that yes we have to age and yes our body does change but we can very much prevent things from from happening as we age we don't have to think to ourselves it's because I'm this old that that's why it's happening to me because, you know, there's always something that you can do to help posture and mobility and um, pelvic floor function. So, yeah, I think that's kind of the key message is that don't be gaslit. You can go do whatever you want to do, whatever age you are, and you shouldn't have your body fail you. Yes, we have to have kids um, because men don't, 
and we're superhuman and we do but you know we have to be able to put ourselves back together again and often we're when looking after our kids and we're not looking after ourselves and actually you know we should be prioritizing ourselves a little bit more and making sure we get the right information and the right um, treatment so that is me and i'm just going to see what everyone's saying um da, da, da. thank you really interesting thank you Nikki. that was really helpful thank you it's been really helpful lovely perfect um been really informed to answer the questions i didn't even know i had excellent that's great me well it's lovely to see everyone and um i'll be back again in what are we now october that'll be december ouch <laughs> so i'll be back in december um but if you fancy um learning a little bit more about the menopause um then come and join us at the beginning of november for nicola's talk the details will be emailed out to you many many times it's i've already created the event so um and if there's anything you think would be useful for you you want a bit more information on that maybe i can't give you then just um just let me know, just send me an email, let me know, and I'll see who I can find that can help us. And I'm sure, Christine, you should do some one of these for me one time, I think, sitting there, um, giving us all this wonderful information about the lymphatic system, but I think we might want to learn about that. <laughs> so I'm going to say good night, sleep well, everyone, have a great evening, and thank you for joining me.